What's going on, people? Welcome back to Kershaw TV, back with another Arsenal Therapy. And today, Dad's still fuming. I'm just taking over the intro. Um, he's still fuming about last night. What's going on, people? Welcome back to Curtis Shaw TV, back with another Arsenal Therapy Cruise. He was going to take over the whole show, but I said, listen, run the intro. Um, but listen, we're back, people. Um, I, I didn't actually call the show Arsenal Therapy because, you know, I, was, I did want us to kind of not get too... I won't say not get too negative because they do deserve a lot of criticism for what we saw last night, but I don't want to... I don't want to just rip everything to shreds here, but that doesn't mean we ain't letting off the clip for last night's performance and Mikel Arteta um, in terms of what, you know, what happened yesterday and our European record. Brexit settings, um, mashing up Europe again, people. I don't know what the hell's wrong with Arsenal when it comes to Europe. Um, I committed two cardinal sins yesterday. I committed two cardinal sins and uh, i got to hold my hands up for them right here and right now, people. First of all, I overhyped Arsenal pre-match. I got caught up. I did. I got caught up in the hype. Battering Burnley, beating Liverpool. I said, listen, Porto, we can go there and roll them over. I think I actually went as far as to say we can win the whole tie in that one performance. And uh, did that come back and bite me? Second one... The, and the ultimate cardinal sin that any Arsenal fan can ever commit. Do not get caught up in the belief that this Arsenal team have quite turned a corner. Are they a good team? Yes. Are they a great team? No. Because great teams win major trophies. I've got so caught up in the performances, the goals. I thought, yo, we can beat anybody in Europe the way we're playing. Now look. We're right back here again. I'm asking myself, why the hell did you allow yourself to get caught up in the bright lights? But it is what it is. I suppose it's what being a football fan is all about. Um, listen, pr playing in the Premier League and playing in the Champions League is two totally different things. And uh, yeah, we saw that last night, but we're going to break it down. Big up Alexander, he said, big up Big C. Inexperienced, immature and naive performance. Reyes positioning has been suspect, not only in this game, 100% his fault for the goal. Big up Alexander. I mean, listen, I'm going to talk. Player rating is going to be, it's going to be nasty. It's going to be nasty. Uh, Ayodeji said, you jinxed it. Uh, Salman said, Curtis, you have to be careful. It's that time of year when Arsenal build you up higher and higher just to drop you like a stone in April. I say to myself all the time, don't get caught up in individual or even groups of performances with Arsenal and start believing that we are that team. Um, listen, and LSU just said it. It is half time. I still believe Arsenal have the capabilities of turning this tie around. It's like starting the game at the Emirates and being 1-0 down early in the game. I still believe Arsenal could come back. But I think what was more damaging about last night is it wasn't necessarily oh, we can't come back against Porto. It was, oh, even if we get past Porto, actually, we're not ready to go to the Bernabeu. We're not ready to go um, to the Allianz Arena and, and, and go to, you know, those difficult away grounds. That was sort of my concern. I'm not actually sitting here today thinking, oh, there's no way we, we, we're going to, you know, get through against Porto. It's more... Well, if you can't beat Porto, who are third in the Portuguese league, how are you going to beat Real Madrid? How do you beat Man City? How do you beat Bayern Munich? That's sort of where the issue is. 18 plus on the player ratings, you're right. Big up Milan who said, I Curtis had an operation on my ACL meniscus yesterday. Was stuck in hospital in pain whilst watching the game. Thank you for your stream. It kept me sane and gave me a bunch of laughs. Big up yourself, bro. Safe recovery. Um, and that's a very serious operation. So hopefully your recovery goes well. Um, if you was watching that Arsenal game, you'd have been in even more pain. So, uh, yeah, good job you weren't watching that too much. But safe recovery. 
So Larry said, Kurt's coming back in Europe is very different from coming back in the Prem. You're right. You are right. You are right, people. And um, listen, we've got a lot to talk about today. A few things that I, I want to talk about. And I mean, it, we're going to get into the player ratings. But a couple of things before we really break down the player ratings. I've got a couple of pictures here that sort of sum up the game last night. And obviously, we're going to go into more detail, but two pictures here. This first picture here, Gabriel Martinelli, 44 seconds of the game to go, 44 seconds. You get the ball on the edge of, well, seven, eight yards outside your penalty area. Number one, you've got a simple pass to Jorginho. I don't mind the fact that you've gone for this pass over here. Saka... I believe Odegaard and Havertz. Obviously, I can't play it, but he doesn't manage to find any of those three players with that pass. Almost reminiscent of Anfield last season when he didn't find Saka on the break, you know, didn't pick the pass. Manages to miss all three of the players in the top left-hand corner, and that's where the goal comes from. Horrendous. Four players that you can find and you don't find any of them that leads to the goal however i'm not blaming him completely i'm not blaming him completely i'm just breaking out second situation for me number one because that mistake doesn't necessarily lead to the goal it's a, you know a domino effect number one here declan rice for me declan rice who i'm, I'm circling here this guy shooting your Probably four yards away from him. You're not close enough. I don't know why Declan Rice isn't doing more to close down the ball there. We're, we're outnumbering them. We've got four against their three there. So Rice doesn't need to back off and think, well, we're outnumbered. What if he plays the pass? Why does Declan Rice not make more of an attempt to close that ball down? Why is he allowing him that much space? That gap is too big. You're not really going to block that shot if he you know, curls it around you. And then, even after that, this goalkeeper, and we're going to talk about it in the player ratings, the crazy thing is, and obviously I can't play this clip, he's actually deeper in his six-yard box here. As the ball flies through the air, he almost ends up on the edge of the six-yard box. It's like, he's is he anticipating that this guy might cross it into the area and try and pick someone out so he steps forward? I don't know, but... I mean, Kero says the yellow card, maybe, but I, I, I don't know. The yellow card had a big effect on Declan Rice's game, that is for sure. Maybe if he isn't on a yellow, he makes a heavy attempt to block that. But for me, three situations there where that goal can be stopped. Martinelli with the poor pass, Rice do more to block it, and David Rea in goal. Now, listen, we're, we're going to hold back on the David Rea conversation until player ratings, but for me... I've said it before and I've said it again. For me, David Rea should save that. I, I, I honestly think... I don't think that shot goes in against Edison. I don't think it goes in against Allison. I don't think it goes in against Jan Oblak. I just don't think it goes in. I really don't. I, I don't see... Now, I, I've seen people saying it's an absolute worldie of a goal. I don't think it is. I've seen people shift the ball out of their feet and whip it in that far top corner before. We've seen it. That ball did not was not flying through the air, you know, with loads of power. It kind of floated over him. And, yeah, for me, I just think a top goalkeeper saves that. I think it's poor goalkeeping, but we're going to speak about it. it. It literally dropped into the bottom corner. You know what I mean? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a worldie of a shot. Uh, Fermal said, uh, see, he's tried to do that defensive-minded control style to counteract continental teams. It was similar with all our Champions League away ties. The issue is we lack the technical players to open up tight areas. That's a good point. Very good point. We went to Lons, struggled. We weren't great against PSV. Sevilla, we did the job. But you're right, he's been a lot more defensive away in Europe. This was an Arsenal pre-Dubai performance and it came back and bit us on the backside because unfortunately we didn't take any chances. Didn't create enough chances. Party after party said, you once said it's easier to win the Champions League over the Prem. I still stand by that, honestly. But we, as I once always said as well, I'm not scared of the opposition, I'm scared of Arsenal and that's why. Chris said, can we stop the world-class player talk? 
The comparison to other player talk, Porto has Champions League pedigree and we don't. We haven't even won the Europa League. I said it the other day, and I don't want this to be um, seen as reactionary. I don't believe Arsenal have a world-class player. I don't. I don't believe Arsenal have a world-class player in their team. Now, not everybody will agree with that. Um, I think William Saliba has the potential to be a world-class centre-back. Hasn't done it consistently in the Champions League, hasn't had the opportunity and hasn't even made his way into the French team yet. Hasn't had the opportunity. I think he has to do more. Declan Rice been at West Ham his whole career. He's just gone to the big club, the bigger situation, Champions League. Still has to prove it. Saka, I think, has been fantastic. Still hasn't gone deep into the Champions League. Hasn't had clutch moments in his career yet in big you know, cup finals and things like that. I think there are a number of players who have the potential. I think Odegaard has the potential as well. I don't think there is a player yet that is world class. I just don't. I think there are three or four that can get there, but I think they've been given that crown before they've actually achieved it. Um, so big up, Chris. Sam said, big up, Big C. Can't believe Raya in the defence. Couldn't put a shot on target. Some even blame Rice against Fulham and West Ham uh, losses. Zero goals scored. Forwards fault. How about the clowns up front actually score? Listen, it's a good point. You look at the three games that we've lost in the last six or seven weeks. We didn't score a goal in any of them. So th there's clearly a problem at times with the attack. Fitz Joseph not going to drop a clip, although they deserve it. It is just that I simply don't understand why Arteta reverted back to the pre-Dubai settings. Crazy. Absolutely spot on, bro. We have been outstanding in the last four to five weeks since Dubai, since the Gold Stakes, since Salt Bay, because we have played with intensity. We have taken shots when we've needed to. We've moved the ball quickly. We've got on the overlap. We've caused problems. Yesterday, everything about that game was pre-Dubai. It was slow. It was boring. It lacked intensity. We lost the game last night because of us. We, like, I don't think Porto were world beaters last night. They had a couple of good chances. They hit us on the break. They let us uh, have possession. I didn't look at Porto and think, wow, what a great team. We can't handle them. I looked at Arsenal and thought, what, what the hell is the game plan? You're playing against a 40-year-old at centre-back. You made him look like prime Maldini. Doing Cruyff turns on the edge of his own box. He looked like an absolute world beater yesterday. He had nothing to play against. So I was so, so disappointed with that Arsenal performance. Absolutely boring is all I can describe that game as. It was boring. You're right. We lightweight. We lacked aggression. Apart from Rice's yellow card, who was getting stuck into their players? You know, where was the aggression? Where was the high press? Where were the shots? How the hell have we... First Champions League game since 2011 that we haven't had a shot on target. Now, don't get me wrong, we're out the Champions League for seven years, but no shot on target in 94 minutes is an absolute disgrace for Arsenal Football Club when you consider the level of players that we've got. If they were playing one of the worst teams in Europe, Porto, I would expect them to have a shot on target. We did nothing against that goalkeeper. So, anyway... Player ratings, this ain't going to be nice. Um, as I said, losing doesn't mean everybody played bad. Winning doesn't mean everybody played well. Porto, eight shots, two on target. You know, they scored there the best chance of the game, hit the post, missed the rebound. I don't know how they missed. Arsenal's best chances really were the headers. Saliba's header and Kai Havertz header. I actually think the Havertz header, if you watch it back, he's completely unmocked. The guy who's trying to get him actually falls over. He should hit the target. 65% possession. 494 passes to their 274. Conce Sal, the manager of Porto, said, Arsenal came here to play. Porto came here to win. Quite damning, whatever you, whatever you make out of what he said. He said, Arsenal came here to play. Porto came here to win. Clearly wasn't bothered if we dominated possession. He knew what we were going to try and do. And I think tactically, Arteta was outdone by the manager yesterday. I really do. Um, I, think he, I think he was comfortable allowing Arsenal to keep the ball, is what he was saying, because he felt like we weren't going to damage them. Uh, Peely said Gabriel was our best player. I thought he was one of the better players, but you know that's still not saying much. Let's get into player ratings, people. Let's get into player ratings. Um, we'll say it as it is, other channels are available, people. Other channels 
are available. David Rail, listen, throughout the game, I thought he was okay, but I'm standing by my belief. Not everyone will agree. Some people say it's a great shot. I don't think it is a great shot. I think it's a looped curling effort that ends up in the bottom corner. It's not even like it ends up in the top corner. David Rea gets a four. Because for me, he was moving like a four-foot goalkeeper. <laughs> I'm sorry, for me, that's like a striker missing an open goal. I think he should save that. I'll give him four and a half. I'll give him four and a half. I wrote four slash four and a half. I'll give him a four and a half. He's a, he, 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 he was in goal like he was four foot five. The position in his poor. We saw it against Chelsea when he got lobbed. We saw it against Newcastle. His positioning at times when he thinks a cross is coming in is not good enough. Is he better than Ramsdale? Should not be the conversation anymore. That that should end that conversation. I'm not interested in is Rea better than Ramsdale. The question should be, is David Rea good enough to be Arsenal's number one goalkeeper? That is the question. If we don't think Ramsdale's good enough, then that's fine. I have no problem with that. Move on, improve him, get somebody better. But my question is, is David Raya good enough to be Arsenal's number one? Can we win a title with David Raya in goal? Is he commanding enough when it comes to crosses? How come we've seen him lobbed on a number of occasions? I think he was gambling, thinking that the cross was coming in, and it ends up being a shot. And he's out of position. So four and a half for David Raya, not good enough. Not good enough. And for me, I've said this before and I've said it again, I don't think that Raya or Ramsdale are title-winning goalkeepers. That's my opinion. I, I, go and get, you know, Magic Mike from AC Milan. Go and get Oblak from Atletico. I don't know. But it's not at the top of the priority list. Elliot said, Raya 5, not at real fault for the goal. The positioning is up for the discussion. And that, I think the positioning is the problem. I think it is the problem, the positioning. And you know what? I just want to say this, right? Just quickly on this comment here, right? Because uh, I get you to a point. I mean, Salman said, Raya is good, um, but not solid enough, at least not yet. Is David Raya better than Emmy Martinez? That's the real question. I, I don't believe he is. Somebody said there, I've lost the comment. Somebody said, you know, he's been decent the last few weeks. Let's not be too reactionary. There it is, Christian. He's been okay the past few weeks. No need to be reactionary. And, and my thing is this. Goalkeepers are defined by moments. The best goalkeepers make the least mistakes. How many mistakes does Alisson make at Liverpool? Hardly any. We hardly ever talk about him. Raya is a solid keeper most weeks. But you've seen at times those little moments he gets lobbed by a cross, gets caught out of position. Those, those are fine margins that can cost you a game, you know. And listen, as I said in the previous picture, I think Rice should do better at blocking the shot. And Martinelli gives away the ball in the first place. So there is a bigger picture. But Raya should have done better. Brilliant with the ball at his feet. Is he a great shot stopper, as Liam said? I don't know. Let's go into the back four. I mean, I'm going to start with Ben White because Ben White, to me, was not good last night. Um, he was way too casual. He gave the ball away on so many occasions. Didn't overlap Saka that much. Again, it was the pre-Dubai performance. Um, is he even better than Leno? Wow, those questions. Yeah, Ben White, for me, was not great. Was not great. I thought he was way too laid back. Um, I'll give him four and a half as well. Four and a half for Ben White, Ben Tan, Benny Blanco. Didn't look at it. Looks super casual. In the Champions League, you cannot give possession away easily. And uh, I, I thought Ben White was not in his zone yesterday. A lot of you giving him fours and threes. Um, I give him four and a half. I, I didn't see him put a decent cross in. I just didn't see enough. I did not see enough from him. Um, let's go to left back, Jakob Kivior. Roasted. Roasted. Yeah, he gets some sympathy because he's not a natural left back. But how many times can I, I say that? At the end of the day, you're playing at left back, roasted, nutmegged, twisted, turned, got booked. Um, it wasn't good. It worried me. It worried me because I'm looking at it going, imagine you're playing Real Madrid tonight and that's Rodrigo or, you know, Vinicius has decided to swap sides with him. He, he was not good. The Kiwi was not ripe. Kivior, for me, 
This rating is not fully his fault because he shouldn't be there, but I give him, I thought he was poor. I give him a four. He's not a left back. I can't blame him. He got megged, he got twisted, he got booked. He doesn't overlap. He doesn't look comfortable inverting. It's a disaster, in my opinion. It's a disaster. Um, it's not his fault. I have to blame the manager. I give him a three and a half. I give him a three and a half. I thought he was genuinely a big, big weakness. Um, let's go to the two centre-backs. William Saliba decided to go for a nap on the pitch. Stands there, watches the guy hit the post, and then stands there and watches him volley it wide from the rebound, snoozing. One of the biggest things in football is do not believe your own hype. We all love you, Saliba. Rolls-Royce, you're a great player. You haven't achieved greatness in your career yet. You've still got a long way to go. That's the only way you become a great player. You don't believe your own hype. You've still got to get in that French team. still got to win major trophies in your career. Yesterday was way too casual. Way too casual. Some decent defending in the second half in 1v1 situations, but the casual nature of his performance, not good enough at all. I give him a four and a half. I thought he was poor. We should have conceded from his mistake. He's lucky we didn't. If we'd have conceded, he would have been getting a two or a three. But he didn't. we didn't concede, but he wasn't good. I give him a four and a half. Brio says four. Elliot says five, Saliba underachieved big time. Three says Fermel, and uh, four says Latte. Uh, let's go to Gabriel. I thought he was the best of the defenders, but still nothing to write home about. I probably would give him a five and a half. I actually don't think Gabriel was that bad. He wasn't great in possession. The goal isn't his fault. Didn't make no major mistake. I would only itch him down to five and a half because... I think defensively he was a bit too sluggish on the ball. Um, but equally, were enough players coming to get the ball off him. In a bad performance, I think Gabriel was one of our better players. But I'm still not... I still thought in possession he was below average. But defensively, he was probably the most solid defender. But um, not great. I, I think he was just below the average six. Um, let's go into midfield. So, uh, most of you giving him five. Some of you giving him six. Some of you giving him five and a half. Elliot said, Gabriel, six, our most consistent <laughs> defender. Sam has said, Gabriel was a five normal, slow like Saliba. Was it the jet lag? Yeah, that two and a half hour flight took you out of him. Uh, Declan Rice. This is, this is a, a complete mixed bag. I actually think that he made some really good tackles considering he was on a yellow card so early. What I didn't like was the passing. Gave the ball away so many times. Didn't need to dive into a tackle like that after 60 seconds. I've seen people again saying Declan Rice yellow card was stupid. Bro, he deserved that yellow card. This is Europe. Like We have to understand Europe is not the Premier League. In the Premier League... The referee probably knows him on a first-name basis. Hey, Deck, calm down, mate. Next one, I'm going to have to book you. They don't care about that in Europe. They don't know you, bro. They probably can barely speak English. Player, come here, yellow card, you dived in. It cost us, and it cost his performance, in my opinion, because he played with the handbrake on. Where I will give him some credit, his tackling was excellent after, and he put a couple of really good corners in that we should have done better. However, his passing was sloppy for me. So I'm going to give him a five and a half. Same as Gabriel. Probably the highest outfield rating of any player for me, to be honest. I thought his passing was poor. He was sloppy in possession. And uh, I, I said it in the thing, man. This is, this is not the conference league. Not the conference league. Listen, Rice and Gabriel are probably our two best players. Probably Declan Rice was probably our best player. But still not at the level that's required. This is the Champions League. You're not playing some, you know, farmers team in the conference league, you know, who've probably just had their pre-match meal in Weatherspoons. Not good enough. Does he close down that shot for the goal quick enough? I don't think he did. So I'm not going to give him an average six. I'm going to give him five and a half. I think he could have done better, but was still one of our better players. Um, let's go to the other two in midfield. For me, I mean, Rice was still the best of our midfield three, in my opinion. Um, Kai Havertz got booked, did nothing. This, again, was 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 a, a non-existent performance. Put in a shift, but not enough. 65 million. These are games, yeah, it's great. He scored a lovely goal against um, Burnley. 
It's great. You scored a penalty against Bournemouth. You know, you got an assist against Man City, but Champions League clutch game, the stadium where you scored the winner in the Champions League final. I'm not singling him out here because the rest of the team was horrible. What did Havertz do yesterday in that game? What did he do in that game? I would rather you tried to get on the ball and made mistakes than do what he did yesterday. He didn't do anything. You wouldn't even know he was on the pitch. Did nothing. Four out of ten. Four out of ten did nothing. Got booked. Put him up front. Did nothing up front. Pointless performance. Manager was forcing it, trying to justify, you know, that he's in some sort of good form. They was asking him in the press conference. He invaded some space. He did nothing. You have an agenda. He does so much off the ball. Still waiting for what he does on the ball. Martin Odegaard. Not a captain's performance for me. I'm sorry. Um, at least he tries to get on the ball. Give him credit for that. Thought he was a bit better than Kai Havertz, but um, let, let's get it. Let's make one thing clear here. A good player will damage you if you give him space, right? A good player will damage you if you give him space. A great player can still damage you if he doesn't have space. That is what separates players like David Silva, right? Prime players in that sort of number 10 position or number 8 position. Those guys, you can still get close to them. They'll rip you apart. Prime Meza Ozil, prime David Silva. You get close to them, they'll still get rid of you. Martin Odegaard, with time and space, is a world beater. You get close to him, you press him, you lean on him. I don't think he's quite the same player, and I don't think he was good enough yesterday. Um, I would probably give him four and a half as well. I don't think I didn't see enough leadership. I saw him get bullied, saw him get pushed to the floor. Oh, ref foul! Didn't get it. I need to see more from him. I know you're not that big physical, Patrick Vieira. I don't expect you to run around kicking people, but I need to see more from you in these games. This is probably why Real Madrid. Let him go, in all seriousness, because maybe there's a ceiling with him that they don't think he can get past, you know. But I, I'm not writing him off, of course, still a quality player. But you want to see Odegaard as captain perform and say, give me the ball. How many times did you watch Arsenal over the years? Alexis Sanchez, give me the ball, I'll make something happen. Meza Ozil, give me the ball, I will split that defence. Is he still too nice? I don't know. But Odegaard... Not good enough for me as a captain. The front three yesterday. Wow. I mean, where do I start? Where do I start out of this front three? I'm going to start with Gabriel Martinelli. I'm going to start with Gabriel Martinelli. Elliot said Odegaard was our best player. I, I, Elliot, respect. Not for me, bro. Not for me. Seen him on the floor. Didn't see a shot. Passing wasn't good enough. I don't know what he. what did he do well. What did Odegaard do well yesterday? Got on the ball a lot, didn't do anything. Gabriel Martinelli, bro. I don't know how you finish that game on the pitch. I really don't. I don't know how you don't get dragged with that performance yesterday. That was Ricky Martin settings. She bangs, she bangs. Oh, babe, the way she moves, she moves. Oh, man, because she looks like a butterfly but stings like a bee. That was Ricky Martin. He might as well have been salsa dancing in the corner of the pitch. Lift your head, bro. I've said it for two years. Lift your head. There's other players on the pitch. Have a look. What are you doing? I said it yesterday. When he's good, he looks like a world beater, generational talent. When he's bad, it looks like he's got rice pudding for a brain. What the hell? Gabriel Martinelli, man, you give me a headache, bro. Seriously, bro. What was that? And he was probably... Listen, let me give him a little bit of sympathy. Just a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> let me give him a bit of sympathy. Just a little bit. Last season, Granit Xhaka was on the overlap. Zinchenko was underlapping. He had two players. Jesus linked up very well. So he had that little triangle of, I've got Xhaka there. I've got Zinchenko there. I've got Gabriel Jesus there. It's no coincidence he scored 15 goals last season. This season, you got Kai Havertz. Where's the overlap? I can't see it. Non-existent. Kivio don't even want to be at left back. And you got Trossard, who we're going to talk about Trossard in a minute. So who's he going to pass the ball to? I don't think we got the ball to him enough. I'm going to give him, I'm going to give him a four. 
I'm gonna give him a four, but it was it was not good to watch, man. He actually did a really good run in the first half, crossed it in, but we we had nothing in there. There was nothing. I give him a four, but something is not right with Martinelli for me. The, I I look at Martinelli and I think if Martinelli played for Liverpool, I think Klopp would have one of the best wingers in the Premier League. I think Klopp would have one of the best wingers in the Premier League. At Arsenal, you're taught, it's, it's like a pick a mix. You don't know what the hell's coming at. I probably, some people are saying I'm being kind giving him a four. Do we itch it down to three and a half? We give him a three and a half. We give him a three and a half. Why not? The front three didn't even have a shot. I'm giving him a three and a half. He, it was horrific. But the, I'm telling you now, I don't think the manager's helping him. I really don't. You put him in Liverpool's team left wing, I think you're looking at one of the best wingers in Europe. In this Arsenal team, at times looks like he doesn't know what to think. He looks confused. It's like, you know, back in the day when, you know, you 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 played Mortal Kombat and you, you hit him with the big punch and finish him. Martinelli's there, like, head spinning around. He don't know where he is. Crazy performance. Bakayo Saka on the right-hand side. I mean, if you want me to describe the Bakayo Saka performance, it would be this. Like, I'm putting my head in my hands, people. I'm putting my head in my hands. I've seen people online all week telling us how world-class he is. I said, cool, I'm an Arsenal fan. We're in good form. I'm not going to say too much. I don't agree with it. But I watched that performance yesterday. We need to stop that conversation and bin it. Put it in the recycle bin on your computer and then empty the recycle bin and pretend the conversation never happened. Just, just stop it. Stop it, people. We had a conversation last week. Hype, do you remember? I appreciate the comment. The conversation, the question that was asked to me was, would I swap Martinelli and Saka for Kylian Mbappe? I said, before you can say the word bonjour, they would be boarding a private jet on their way to Paris. They would be out of the club for Kylian Mbappe. I'd give them the training ground for Mbappe. I want the apologies to be as loud as the criticism. I, I, they would have been gone. Both of them. Straight, Kylian Mbappé, gone. <laughs> Get them out. Not that they're, they're not bad players, of course not. But Kylian, both of them can go. I'd, I'd probably chuck you in another two players. You take Martinelli and Saki, you can have Havertz and Kivy or absolutely free. They can all go. I'll give you seven players for Mbappé, genuinely. And we'll, we'll just deal with a bronze team on FIFA with Mbappé. Bakayo Saka last night, that was the worst performance of the season. Absolutely horrific. Horrific. One out of ten. And I love Saka. Horrific. Can, can I ask a question? Is, is Saka banned from doing stepovers, nutmegs, shimmies? Um, is he banned from doing tricks? I want to know. I don't forget. You know, you know. Is Saka banned from doing tricks? Is what I want to know. Where's the stepovers, bro? Where's the nutmegs? Kivio's getting nutmegged on the other side of the pitch. Why can't Saka nutmeg someone? It is. It, there's no sauce. I need some sauce on the pitch. Drop a stepover on someone, bro. Move the defender. Do something. I said it before and I said it again. You can tell Saka was in academy from eight years of age. He never learnt how to play football in the streets. Because you can tell them Zahars, them Balasses. You know what street football is like, people. You nutmeg someone, the whole park was going crazy. Oh, oh. He never went through that, bro. He was in academy football, non-contact. Saka, mate, wow. That performance... Woo! That was like dry toast with nothing on it, bro. Dry. Bread back. That was a bread back performance. Hella dry. No sauce, no butter, no margarine, no peanut butter, no jam. Nothing. Dry. Pure dry. Like when you come out the bath and you ain't put cocoa butter between your fingers. Dry. 
What the hell? I would have took him back to London last night and put him in the middle of Hackney, Brixton, Tottenham, Wood Green. Say, go on that park and, and learn. I love you, Saka, and I'm sorry to do this to you, bro. But boy, that was dry, man. You've been there. You've come out the shower between your hands, them little dry bits. You need the cocoa butter. That dry, fam. Bread back. Bread back, Saka. I said, what? Nah, man, Saka, don't do that ever again. I'm, I'm, I'm still shocked. I love you, Saka, you know, star boy, but brother, that was a bread back performance, man. I didn't know what I was watching last night. Meanwhile, Kivio's up the other end, getting twisted, turned, nutmegged, doing spinning around like the Tasmanian devil. I don't know what the hell's going on. Bread back, Saka. Big up, Southern Guna, play on the concrete with... Blah. They need FIFA Street, man. This man didn't grow up on FIFA Street. and Nah, man. And let's finish it off. Oh, oh, God. Oh, my days. All I can say, when this guy walked off the pitch last night, I hope there was a breathalyzer waiting for this guy. It's the only thing. This started off as a joke, by the way, on this channel. Trossard's birthday was Luton Town away. I said, he must have gone out last night. He's playing like he's drunk. He had a nightmare. We're now calling him Stella R. Trossard because he's played like he's had five cans of Stella Artois. Can somebody explain the Trossard performance to me last night? I thought he was playing for Porto. Trossard, they're calling him. What the hell was that from Trossard? Absolutely steaming. Steaming, breathalyzing, Stella or Trossard, aka Drossard, Drunkyard. I don't know what that was. When Trossard plays well, the grey hairs that he has, I say, yeah, man, Silver Fox, he can run with that. He's a baller anyway, so I don't mind. Maybe he had a stressful upbringing in Belgium. Last night, he looked like a pensioner. What the hell was that? Honestly, no, don't worry. You're probably looking at the computer thinking, as he crashed? Because I went, I, I just had to sit still there. No, I'm still here, people. I cannot believe the performance from him yesterday. He was doing the mannequin challenge. That girl is a real crowd pleaser. He just stood there. One of the worst striker performances I've ever seen. And I've seen bad ones, trust me. Shamax, Bentners, Sonogos. Eddie and Ketias, I don't know what the hell that was. That was Grandpa Trossard. One out of ten. Horrific performance. Horrific. He might need some time off. I don't know what the hell that was. You know, I thought I thought Pepe was the oldest player on the pitch. Trossard was moving like he was 65 years of age. Pensioner yesterday. Jesus. Bad. Bad performance. Um, the substitute. The only substitute of the evening, people. Because our world-class generational young manager, if you can't see what Arteta does, you don't deserve Arsenal. That's what they tell me online. You don't even deserve Arteta. You called him the cone man. We'll talk about him in the next minute or so. Jorginho came on and uh, Jorginho decided, I'm just going to give the ball away. I'm just going to give the ball away as many times as I can. Um, you know, I've got 20 minutes. I reckon I can give it away five times. I think he gave it away about seven times. Um, that was the Jorginho that Chelsea said, we ain't giving him a new contract. Arsenal can have him. That was Jorginho. I think he gave the ball away about four times. Uh, I'll give him three out of 10. What kind of influence was that off the bench? Zero. Awful. Give him three out of ten, just purely because he wasn't on the pitch for the whole 90 minutes. He was awful. The team were jet-lagged, people. That flight to Portugal, two and a half hours, they, they, they're finished. It's a different time zone. Um, let's talk about um, Mikel. Let's talk about Mikel. We need to have a conversation about the manager, I'm afraid, and uh, it's serious. It's a serious conversation. Let's talk about this guy, Mikel Arteta, in Europe. I don't know what the hell happens, but when this guy leaves and ends up in Europe, 
he is not the same guy. I don't know. You would think as well for a guy that's from Spain, Europe wouldn't be a problem for him. Like, what happens to this guy when he travels out of this country and goes into Europe? I mean, he looks like in that picture he's about to do a Martin Odegaard special. Uh, no, not a great through ball. Um, he's about to draw snot out of his nose. Um, Olympiakos. I think that was last 32. Europa League, Aubameyang misses, get knocked out. You think that's bad? Villarreal, Unai Emery, false nine, Emil Smith-Rowe, remember that? Takes off Aubameyang with 10 minutes to go, brings on Willian. Had me shouting at the screen. My head was so hot, I thought he was going to explode. Then you've got Sport in Lisbon. Guys lobbing Ramsdale from 45 yards out in a last 16 game. We've got bigger fish to fry, they said. We never, we never caught no fish. We couldn't even find Nemo. That's how small the fish was that we were looking for. And then Porto with a 41-year-old. 41 he turns next week. How old is Mikel Arteta? Real talk. Mikel Arteta's 41. So this time, in, in six days, Pepe will be the same age as our manager. And that guy put in an absolute masterclass against our attack last night. So what are we going to do next week? Are we going to put Mikel Arteta centre midfield with Declan Rice next week? They had a 40, the, the guy's going to be 41 for the return leg. Same age as our manager, boss in our attack. Mikel Arteta was completely outdone and outclassed by that manager last night. Forget possession, forget control, forget all them buzzwords. He got done. Conse Sao done him. He said, yeah, you lot can have the ball, mate. You ain't going to affect us. You ain't going to shoot from distance. You're going to slow down. And you ain't going to do nothing. No shots on target. Zero out of ten. Sorry. We did nothing. We could have played there for another three weeks. We wouldn't have had a shot. I think to not have a shot on target in the knockout stage of a European game is absolutely disgraceful. I'm being serious. That is one of the worst performances that I've seen in Europe going forward. I'm surprised I finished the game on stream. I'm surprised I wasn't asleep by the end of the game. One of the most boring, lacklustre performances that I have seen in Europe. So boring. So boring. We did nothing. We did nothing. And we got what we deserved. We didn't deserve to win that game. And I think a draw might have been fair, but we did nothing to win it. And it needs to be a wake-up call for this football club very quick. I'm going to go through these super chats. Carl said, did Trossard play? Uh, I think he was playing card games that led to drink because uh, he played like he was steaming. MJ said, the thing is, see, what can Teta even say to help the players rise to the occasion? He's done nothing at this level as a player or coach. You're captain too. But the thing is, the only thing I would say with that, MJ, and listen, whilst I agree he's an inexperienced manager, as a player he didn't have a huge career, Jose Mourinho didn't have a huge football career. Jurgen Klopp didn't. Arsene Wenger didn't. I know they had a lot more experience as managers, you know, at the time, but he, he still should understand how to motivate these players, you know. But as I said, he's learning on the job. That's the problem. Firmal said Odegaard isn't press resistant. I hear you. You get close to Odegaard and, and give him a physical battle, he struggles. That's something he needs to overcome. Big up Matt the Southern Gooner. Hope you're well, bro. Make sure you go and follow his channel. He said, brother, we struggle against dark hearts and a solid defence. Time to step up in Europe. That game revealed our weakness. Champions League and experience was on full display. I expect more, more dark hearts on Saturday. Got a toughen up to light. And you're bang on, bro. You're bang on. A narrative that I saw online yesterday was Port Oa cheats. The referee's rubbish. That's what I saw yesterday. If you don't understand what referees are like in Europe, then there's something wrong, Arsenal. We all know what European referees are like. They'll give a yellow card real quick. Dark arts. Dark arts is part of football. One of the things that made the Invincibles so good wasn't just because... We played great football. Thierry scored loads of goals. Perez was great. Burkamp was great. Part of what made us so good was, if you wanted to have a scrap, mate, Patrick Vieira will square up to you. Lauren might give you a dig in the ribs. Ray Parler might leave one on you. That's what made Arsenal so great. You wanted dark arts. We were ready for it. 
Dark Horse is Pepe last night stamping on Odegaard's foot, going up to the ref, sorry ref, I'm innocent, doesn't get a yellow card. 30 seconds later, gets brushed on his shoulder, rolling around the floor, gets a free kick. That's Dark Horse. People online were fuming about that. I wasn't fuming about that. That's football in Europe. I was fuming that our nice boys felt sorry for themselves. Oh, the referee's so bad he won't give me a free kick. Learn, bro. This is Europe. This is why we ain't won the Europa League, let alone the Champions League. Dark Arts is part of football. We're too nice. Too nice. Got to be more ruthless. Got to be nasty. That's how you win. That's how you win, but too, too nice. Rodri is the prince of Dark Arts. Yeah, horrible. Every other team hates Rodri because he winds up the fans. He rolls around the floor. When he's got a tackle yard, bang, he's dirty. You can see he's got that nasty side to it. We're too nice. Way too nice. Way too nice. Um, let me get through these Super Chats. Apologies. Uh, they've mounted up a little bit, so I'm going to skim through them and then we'll move on. Um, but big up Southern Guna. Big up MJ said, world-class wingers go San Siro, bag a hat-trick. Saka is a left-back. Ah. Listen, I know obviously you're referring to Gareth Bale. Saka's still a quality player, but he has to evolve, man. Pokemon settings. We need, you know, it's, uh, we got, what is it? Carmelian? Chameleon? We need Charizard, man. He ain't there yet. Brio said Trossard needs to steer at Dennis Bergkamp's statue for 20 minutes. Uh, he needs to do something. He needs to sober up. Dennis said this super chat is for Cruz to get some legends in FIFA, but eFootball is where it's at. Dennis, really appreciate that, bro. Big up Cruz as well. He obviously introduced today's show. Uh, he was like, Dad, let me introduce it. I said, do what you want, mate. You know what I mean? Do you, you can run the whole show if you want. Um, man turned up in a do-rag and all sorts. But anyway, big up uh, Cruz and big up everyone locked in. Appreciate the super chats. And uh, let's move on. Listen, I want to make something clear. Because anybody tuning in today will say it's very negative. And it is. And it deserves to be. I'm sorry, people. I've been singing the praises of this team week after week after week. Constructive criticism is part of football. If anybody thinks you shouldn't criticise players when they've played poorly, then you're watching the wrong sport. They deserve to be criticised. One thing I want to make abundantly clear. It's not over. It's not over. Arsenal can beat Porto at home. Arsenal can over overturn a one-goal deficit in the home leg. As much as we lost last night, I didn't watch Porto last night and think, this is a real top team. I, they're decent. I have to give them their respect. But I, I'm not afraid of Porto. It's Arsenal that are the problem. And... They need to put in one hell of a performance. They need to score early and turn this around. I do actually believe we can beat Porto in the home leg and go through. As I said, the thing that gave me the biggest um, negative feeling from last night was not necessarily, oh, can we beat Porto or not? It was, well, if, you, if you're playing like that against Porto, how are you going to overcome Real Madrid, Man City, Bayern Munich, PSG? Teams that I've been looking at, you know, going, well, I think we're better than some of them. I'm now going, you think Porto's a pressure cooker. You go to Paris and get Mbappe in full flow running at Ben White and Dembele running at Kivior, you know, or Real Madrid with Vinicius Jr. dropping four stepovers on Ben White. You're going to have to go to a whole new level. Levels that some of our players may not have ever seen before. The craziest thing about last night's game, Kai Havertz had the most Champions League experience of any of the Arsenal starting eleven. Obviously, Jorginho on the bench had more. David Rea hasn't played in it. Ben White hasn't played in it. Gabriel played in it a little bit at Lille. Saliba for a little bit at Marseille. Kivior, I don't think, played in it. Odegaard, a few appearances. Rice never played in it. Saka hasn't. Martinelli hasn't, Trossard hasn't, Havertz the most experienced Champions League player. Now, when you're in a competition that is elite level, you don't want Kai Havertz to be your most experienced player in that competition. He's far from a leader. So, yeah, we are lacking. And of course, we've spoken about it time after time after time. We are missing key players. And I know it is a reason, but I think we have to understand that that World Cup and the amount of football, it seems to have had an effect on everybody and everybody has 
a lot of injuries at the moment. So it is a reason, but it's something we have to deal with. You know, you look at Liverpool, the amount of injuries they've got at the moment. So we can't we can't hide from it. I said a long time ago that Thomas Partey is one of the most influential players in the Arsenal team. He really is. And I think we're missing him massively. I know we've done well without him, but I just think we need his power and his progressive passing. And I think it would allow us to be better moving forward. You get more out of Declan Rice, but is Partey ever going to be fit? I don't know. Vegas Gunner said Arteta was a coward yesterday. He played to win, simple. You know, I don't want to see Arsenal playing for control. Play to beat them. Anyway, Waffle Settings is back. Cone Man music was back in full effect yesterday, people. I wish it wasn't, but it was. Um, Arsenal were beaten by Porto. Uh, outsmarted, in my opinion, by that manager, Conceição, who uh, was a good player and looks a good manager as well. He said Arsenal came here to play. Porto came here to win, saying that, having loads of possession was not the aim of the game. So he clearly knew what Arsenal were going to try and do. He wasn't afraid of it. He planned for it and it worked. And uh, it's frustrating that we weren't able to overcome um, that Porto team and didn't ask enough questions of 40-year-old uh, Pepe, uh, who put in a very good display, by the way. Uh, let's go through this press conference. It wasn't a particularly long one. Uh, on if the boss was surprised by our performance, he said, no, obviously we're disappointed the way we gave the game away at the end, not managing the situation. You get punished in the Champions League. If you cannot win, you don't lose. We really dominated the game, but we lack purpose, especially in the first half, to have more aggression, to break the lines, to generate threat in their back line. In the second half, there were much better things. We generated a lot of situations without creating much from it. We'll learn. It's clear it's half time. If you want to be in the quarterfinals, you have to beat your opponent, and that will be the purpose. I mean, dominated possession, but we didn't create enough at all. Um, on how Porto were able to break up our fluidity, uh, that's the context of the game. Uh, we knew we prepared for it. That's something the referee has to manage. We cannot do anything about it, and we're going to have to handle it. Uh, I don't want to hear the referee blamed. You know, I just don't. We've got to be smarter. And if we didn't press enough for Porto's goal, he said, especially with the way we gave the ball away three times in a row in that area, we cannot do it. On the way Porto defended, we are very used to playing against a defensive block. As I said, especially in the first half, we had certain things and we will learn from it. Were we victims of a lack of experience in the last few minutes of the game? He said, um, it's only the last ball in the 94th minute. We didn't have the naivety in that one. Uh, I think it's a bit cruel to judge it, but it's true. They had a big impact on the result. A lot of other things that they've done for the first time here, it was very good. I don't think there was a lot that we did in that game that was very good. On not having a shot on target for the first time in two years. Wow. He said, credit to them. They defended well. It's true. We got in certain situations. We didn't finish the action or put the right ball in or the cross. Every time we were touching somebody, it seemed to be a foul before we even kicked the ball. We learn from that and be better. Listen, we can't blame it. It's the dark arts. Learn the game. You know it. On the pitch potentially being an issue. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is horrific. That question is an absolute disgrace. Honestly. One of those journalists there have tried to brown nose the manager by putting that question in. You've tried to pretend that there's something wrong with the pitch. The manager said, I don't think so. I think the pitch was good. It was fast. We are used to that. That, for me, is an absolute disgrace from that journalist. Trying to be buddies with everyone. Oh, how about the pitch? Maybe the pitch stopped us from winning. That is just pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. You're trying to talk about the pitch. Uh, they're the kind of questions that drive me insane. Horrific question. And I'm glad Arteta didn't blame the pitch, but what are you talking about, mate? I'd love to know who asked that question, but... Oh, football friend, let me give him an excuse so that I get, you know, more more rights in the next press conference. Shocking. End the stream. Waffle settings in full effect. Cordova said Real Madrid will want to attack us eventually. Uh, it'll give us increased XG. Low block teams are a major problem when... Uh, we will win at home, he says. Yeah, Madrid will attack us, which might suit us, but the problem is they might score against us, which won't suit us. 
Gunnarola said, a lesson for some fans that jump on the player hype drain to train too soon. None of our current forward players bar Saka are indispensable. All those saying Gabriel Jesus don't get enough ahead of Trossard, think again. I think one thing we learned yesterday is whether it's Trossard, whether it's Jesus, whether it's Havertz, whether it's Eddie and Ketio, this football club desperately, and I, I reiterate this, desperately needs a striker. Trossard at the weekend, I thought was brilliant. Absolutely outstanding. But the reality is, it was against um, it was against Burnley. They're, they're one of the worst teams. They're a championship team in the Prem. So we have to be honest and say, this football club, more than anything, needs to buy a quality, aggressive striker in the summer. Whether that's Tony, whether that's Osimhen, whether it's Sesco, Jimenez, whoever... You have to buy a striker. You've got to get rid of Eddie and Ketia. A thing that I thought was crazy about last night, as much as we're sitting there saying this bench isn't good enough, you look at the bench. Cedric was signed by Arteta. El Nenny and Eddie and Ketia, Reese Nelson and Emil Smith Rowe were all given new contracts by Mikel Arteta. Aaron Ramsdale was signed by Mikel Arteta. So six or seven of those first team players, Jorginho was signed by Mikel Arteta. So though that bench is your bench. So saying the bench isn't good enough, that's your bench. You gave Cedric 75 grand a week. You gave Emil Smith Rowe the 10 shirt. You gave Eddie and Ketty a 14, 100 grand a week. So why do you not trust them under circumstances when we needed somebody to come on and influence that game? What do we lose last night by throwing on Reese Nelson? And saying, just just run at someone and try and do something for us. You know what I mean? What do we lose by him doing that? But he doesn't trust them. Why, why keep them if you don't trust them? Why give them such good contracts if you don't trust them? It makes no sense. He has to manage the squad better. Young Gunner said, the Barca-Napoli game was a tight game. Both teams looked to their strikers to bag a goal. False, false nine only works for so long. Our strikers are not elite. And another thing, and you're right, Osimhen and Lewandowski scored in that game last night. Teams have been successful with false nines. Liverpool were successful with Firmino. They got two wingers who were scoring strikers' numbers, Mane and Salah. Man City won the league with wingers who scored loads of goals. Mares and players like that. Raheem Sterling. Um, we don't have wingers that are huge goal getters. We're not getting 25 goals out of Martinelli and Saka. So our striker on certain days needs to be the match winner. And unfortunately, the false nine will work some days when we're bossing the game. There's a lot of movement in this space. When you're up against two solid centre-backs and they deny you space, Trossard will struggle. He struggled to hold the ball up yesterday. He didn't win his headers, of course, against big six-foot defenders. And the system didn't work. Looking ahead. Looking ahead, people. Because I don't like to end the stream in a negative way. Because football, the reality is you do lose games. What I, what I was disgusted about last night was how we lost the game. For me, was horrific. There's ways of losing. You don't lose the way you lost last night. You don't turn up as a big football club and not have a shot on target. That's pathetic. Also, I have to bounce back. By bouncing back, you've got to beat Newcastle on Saturday night. Eight o'clock kickoff under the lights at the Emirates. We know we're in a situation now. The margin for error in the league is so fine. You cannot afford to drop points in games like this. Arsenal have got to beat Newcastle. Liverpool won the game last night. Not surprised by that. Um, they were 1-0 down against Luton. I was a bit hyped at halftime. That disappeared real quick. And uh, we were back to square one. So Liverpool are top, five points clear. We have a game in hand, win that game in hand, two points behind. 8pm Saturday night, Newcastle caused us problems at their ground. They caused us problems at our ground last season. That will not be an easy game. They will try and hit us in transition. And um, we're going to have to bounce back. We are going to have to bounce back. Because Newcastle put a lot of people behind the ball. And they'll hit you in transition with Gordon and players like that on the break. So this is a, a very tricky game. Very tricky game. I'm just checking here uh, the weekend's games in the in the Premier League just to see if, if City and them teams got anybody difficult that will trouble them. I mean, Man City got Bournemouth away. That's a write-off. That's three points. 
Liverpool don't play. They've got the AFL Cup final on Sunday. So, yeah, an opportunity to make up some ground on Liverpool, get two points behind them. I think City will beat Bournemouth comfortably. We have got to win on Saturday against Newcastle. Not a draw, not nothing. We have to respond. And as I said, we've got a little break now in the Champions League. We don't play until the 12th of March. So you're looking at nearly three weeks before that return leg. Our next three games are Newcastle, Sheffield United and Brentford. Um, that has to be three wins. That has got to be three league wins um, before we go in that second leg against Porter. If we're going to do anything, that has got to be three wins out of three and then the international breaks after the Porto game. So Newcastle, Sheffield United, Brentford, Porto, that, that collective there needs to be four victories. Anything less and you're in all sorts of trouble. Or beat Newcastle, go and smash Sheffield United, beat Brentford, beat Porto and you're back on track. Anything less and we're in all sorts of trouble. Cormac said, would you accept third place and no trophy? Is it time for a change? I've said it before and I say it again. And I reiterate this and I stand by this. And this isn't a reaction to last night. This is my genuine feeling. If Arsenal don't win a trophy and finish like third, for example, I would be. I think Arsenal should be looking at the possibility of replacing him in the summer, Mikel Artel. Now, not everybody will agree with that. I realise he's improved us. We spoke about this last night. He's definitely progressed the football club from when he took over. But if he doesn't get out of this season with a trophy, I just don't see how he gets us over the finish line in the big trophies. Yeah, you know, he's won an FA Cup. That will be, next season will be his sixth season at the football club. This is his fifth full season. This is one of the biggest football clubs on the planet. How many managers get five years at a major football club and you haven't won any of the major trophies and you've only actually won one trophy in that time? Thomas Tuchel, one bad year, out the door, Bayern Munich, done. No patience. I'm not saying that's how we should run the football club. If you'd been here a year, two years, two and a half years, then maybe the argument should be I need to give him more time. Five seasons at Arsenal, one FA Cup. Are you telling me that's an unbelievable achievement? I don't think it is. I, I think he's done well. He's progressed us in the league. He took us backwards. Then he's brought us back forwards. I respect that. Top four challenge for a title. One FA Cup after five years and 700 million is not me celebrating in the street. I, be, I I don't look at that achievement and think, you know what? There's only one or two managers in the world who could have done that. I think there are a number of managers in the world that could have come to Arsenal, spent 700 million and had five years and done more than winning one FA Cup. The, the crazy thing, and I, I respect him because he won the FA Cup, but he won the FA Cup with the players that he didn't want. He, he got rid of Emi, he got rid of Aubameyang and all that. So since creating his team, his squad, we haven't even reached a final of, a tro of, of any trophy. So listen, it might sound um, brutal, it might sound um, harsh, but he needs, to, um, he needs to do better for me. Yeah, end of this season would be four full seasons and one half a season, four and a half years at Arsenal. Come on. Come on, man. I need to see bigger. I need to see more. You know, I've seen big clubs have managers. How, my question is always, how long do you give him? How long do you give him? People say, give him another year. Give him another year. Give him another year. But when do you actually say, maybe you're not quite the guy to take us where we need to get to? Now, let me get one thing clear. Arteta's going absolutely nowhere. Let me get one thing clear. Arteta will be Arsenal manager first day of next season. Why? Because we're going to get Champions League football this season. And with Champions League football, you will keep your job under the Cronkays because Champions League football keeps them rich. It keeps them rich. It makes this uh, a profitable football club and business for the Cronkays. The only way the Cronkays will lean on Arteta and pressure him is if he starts taking money out of their pockets. Champions League football, pat on the back, shake his hand, see you again next season. He'll probably even get a new contract. I believe he's got 18 months left on his deal. 
So they will probably give him a new deal at the end of the season. They won't allow him to go into the last year of his deal. Arteta will get a new contract this summer. Trust me on that. He'll get top four, then he'll get a new deal during preseason while everyone's calm, while we're on holiday, while we're on tour, sun's out, you're not too hyped. They will then drop the three-year contract on us. We've seen this story before. We know how it ends, people. We've seen it. We know exactly what happens. Arteta will sign a new three-year deal. Top four is a trophy to KSE. High five yet? Yeah, tick the boxes. They'll be at the NBA. High five in Jokic, NBA playoffs. How are Arsenal getting on? Top four? Great stuff. Let's go again. Give him a new deal. Um, let me read out these super chats. Uh, Jerome said, big big up Big C. I almost died laughing last night when you unsubscribed Naveen. Classic OG gangster-ish. Keep doing the thing. Listen, you know me. I've got no problem, you know, with people having a go at me in the comments. Just don't get overly disrespectful with it. We'll have a strong footballing debate. Naveen was just spamming, spamming, spamming. And then it ended up by saying, oh, I think I'm going to have to unsubscribe. I said, you know what? I'm going to save you the hassle. Go on about your business. Other channels are available. So you had to, to make them know, man. Vegas Gunner said, are you worried that Arteta has burned the starters out? Possibly. Because the problem is, Vegas, um, if he was to turn to Fabio Vieira now or Smith Rowe or Nelson, are they even in the zone of... Are they fit and sharp and, and match-tested enough to come in and have a big impact? Because you're not using Smith-Rowe. So if all of a sudden you've got to dash Smith-Rowe in for Man City away, is Smith-Rowe even going to play well? Maybe not. He's not match-fit. He's not sharp. So, uh, yeah, may, maybe the Sackers, Martinelli's, Odegaard's, maybe they are burnt out. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but good question. Good point. Uh, Highbury Ultra, if Mikel Arteta don't work, final straw, KSE need to go. Listen, some some owners are here. They own clubs, of course, to make money. You're a billionaire owner. I don't expect you to buy a football club and not try and make money. But some owners live and breathe success. Everybody criticised Roman Abramovich, and of course there was things morally may not have been correct about how he earned his money. But if we're talking about just straight football ownership, everybody knew Roman was at Chelsea to win. Not win a Carabao Cup, win win the Champions League, win the Premier League. You heard the Lampard interview. The guy came in the dressing room after finishing second in the Premier League and said there is going to be big changes in the summer. Arsenal fans, and I know this context, we've been out of the top four for a while. It was in a title race against Man City. But I'm just trying to show you the level. Second at Chelsea with Roman was seen as, yo, people are losing their job. Players are getting sold. The manager might get sacked. At Arsenal, we were going, oh, second, brilliant, great progress. Trust the process. Go again. I get it. We've come from a dark place and we're trying to build our way up. But the mindset comes from the ownership. And I don't believe they are demanding that we win the major trophies. They want it, but they're not desperate for it. We know the Man City owners, they're not messing about. They're not here to finish fourth. They're not going to high-five Pep if he finishes second. It's, it will be a crisis. And the, the mindset needs to change from the owners, but they don't need it to because they're making money. The mindset has to start with the fan base. The fans have to now pressurise the football club and say, listen, we've given the manager time. We've been patient with him. We've sat through the process. We've sat through Cedric and Pablo, Pablo Mari and Socrates and Eddie and Ketty or an El Nenny getting a new contract and Kivior playing at left back and inverted fullback. How much more do we need to sit through before we get, you know, the reward at the end of it? When you go to work all week, if you don't like your job, you say, well, you know, at least at the end of the month, I get the wages. When are we going to get the success at the end of the process. What is the process leading to? Is always the question. Is the process second? Champions League qualification? Because I remember seven years ago, fans protesting to get Arsene Wenger out of the football club because we said top four wasn't enough. So is top four now enough five, six, seven years later? That's what we need to understand as a fan base. What is the target? What is the narrative? What is the aim? You know, I don't know. I have my own thought process, and a lot of you do, but there are a lot of people who just think we're happy just ticking along. 
Brio said, um, Arteta doesn't believe in cups. Drinking from the hand. Listen, uh, he can say whatever he wants, but Arteta does not care about the FA Cup and the Carabao Cup. I don't know why. I think he's making a mistake not doing that. I think if you finish second last year and win the FA Cup, you can seriously draw positives out of that. Finishing second or third this year, not winning anything, I think just feels flat, feels disappointing. Reality of the situation as a fan, as a player, the most memorable days of your life as a fan are the days your club was successful and won something. Unless you're a relegation battling team and you're trying to stay in the league. Uh, if I said to you now, what's your most memorable recent memory of Arsenal, like big, big memory, you're going to say FA Cup final. Aubameyang chipping the Chelsea goalkeeper. You're not going to say, oh, you know, when we beat Bournemouth. Okay, Bournemouth was a great moment. I thought we were going to win the league. But you remember the cup finals. You remember those great moments. They go down in history. So for me, Arteta, whilst trying to get into the, the winner's spot, should have won a Carabao Cup, should have won an FA Cup, should have, you know, kept trying to win things whilst trying to get Pep and, and win that, you know, title or Champions League. But listen, there's a long way to go. Um, we have to respond. We haven't got a lot of time. It's Friday tomorrow. Um, they'll have a, a recovery session today, training session tomorrow. And then they go again. Newcastle haven't played midweek. They'll be fresh. They'll be at us Saturday night. It's on Sky Sports, I believe. They have got to beat. They've got to beat Newcastle. Anything less, and we are in a crisis. Cormac, you're right. Liverpool have a culture of uh, ex an expectation of trophies. Like I said, growing up, I always saw a lot of Liverpool. My dad's a Liverpool fan. I got some close friends that are Liverpool fans. And even when Liverpool were not that good, i.e., Gerard Houllier, maybe Rafa Benitez, not winning the Premier League, of course, and we clown them for that. Liverpool were winning the Champions League. Liverpool were winning FA Cups. Liverpool were winning Carabao Cups, UEFA Cups. We need to put trophies in the cabinet. You can only win four trophies. Get one of them at least if you can. Get to finals. Get us to Wembley. You know, give us that excitement. Oh, it's on TNT Sports apparently. If the process was a computer, it would be replaced. Bro, if Arsenal's process was a computer... We'd be using dial-up internet that I used to use back in the day when I was on Diamond Cable. Remember that mad noise it used to make? Dun, 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 dun. And you'd be sitting there waiting like, yo, any chance? You'd go on Yahoo. I think Yahoo was the search engine back then. Ash Jeeves. You'd type in at the top, Yahoo. You'd be sitting there for like 30 seconds watching it load. Like, I still haven't even got on the on the screen yet to search. I'm on LimeWire trying to download one song on my blank CD. I've been here for 15 minutes. Now the phone's rang. Mum's on the phone. My internet's cut off. That would be Arsenal. That would be the process. We are one of them old school, massive computers, desktop with a big, you know what I mean, and the speaker and all that, and dial up internet. You've got to keep refreshing it. LimeWire settings, MSN business. I don't know what kind of process it is. I'm still waiting for it, though. Uh, HD Gaming said, unfortunately, I'll be missing the stream. Bro's in hospital, not breathing well. Got pneumonia. Get well soon, bro. Get well soon. Um, free mega, free megabyte and dial-up disconnects. Trust the process, people. Trust the process. Floppy disks. Remember floppy disks, yo. They, 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 don't, they don't even understand, man. Nostalgia FC. Anyway, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. Thank you very much, Arsenal Therapy. At as I was going to say it's been a pleasure. It has been a pleasure, but for the wrong reasons. Um, big up crews who introed the show today. Um, and uh, listen, we'll be back tomorrow, 2 p.m. Time doesn't wait. Arsenal, you can't feel sorry for yourselves. Brush it off your shoulder. Go again tomorrow. Um, training tomorrow. Press conference reaction. More waffle on Friday. And um, I suppose the big question is, are any of the injured players going to be back? Gabriel Jesus, Thomas Partey, Zinchenko, Tomeyasu, Timber is long-term. Partey's been training. And where is Tomeyasu since coming back from the Asia Cup? Um, because for me, you're going to need Tomeyasu at left-back if he's available, um, especially with the likes of Almiron and Anthony Gordon out wide for Newcastle. So listen, 
Big up everyone, thank you for tuning in. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel. I'll be doing the show with Turkish on Sunday, so look out for that. 2 p.m. tomorrow, we'll be back with a preview. And then Saturday, we will be doing the Arsenal watch along. And Sunday, I'm going to do the Carabao Cup final watch along as well. Take care, enjoy your Thursday, and I'll see you all tomorrow, people. Bless. <laughs>